Joining me now to discuss this further is Eugene Kontorovich. He is a professor at the George Mason's Antonin Scalia School of Law. Uh, Eugene, thank you for being with us. Uh, Eugene, Omar, again, being accused of being anti-Semitic, uh, accusing Jews of having a dual loyalties is, is yet another anti-Semitic trope, but she's not apologizing this time. And as uh, Dan mentioned, the House Democrats will offer a resolution tomorrow condemning anti-Semitism in a, res in, in a response to this, in a general response. Do you think that this is a sufficient way of dealing with this? Uh, it's certainly not sufficient, and even the insufficient response may not happen. The problem here uh, is not that most House Democrats are anti-Semitic. We know that most Democrats are certainly not anti-Semitic, regardless of their views of Israel. The problem is, uh, in the most recent elections, several people were elected who seemed to be militantly anti-Semitic and express this at every possible turn. The question isn't whether Democrats are anti-Semitic, the question is whether they have the political courage to confront the loud, vocal, and in some quarters popular members of their own caucus who are expressing anti-Semitic views. And the latest developments that Dan mentioned suggest that they're not. Uh, it seems that the vote on a mere resolution condemning anti-Semitism, not condemning Representative Omar herself, not condemning her particular statements, even that resolution, it seems, is going to be put off uh, until potentially other things are added to it, like condemning anti-Semitism and anti-Islamic views as well. Now, of course, both are entirely condemnable, but once you make it a general resolution condemning all bad things, it's even further away from any actual criticism of Representative Omar. It's not just about her, it's just saying bad things are bad. And that is not the Democrats policing their own caucus, that's the Democrats punting. Should she be removed from the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, or uh, does she add a, a, another perspective, as uh, some have claimed? Yeah, not all perspectives need to be on the House uh, Foreign Relations Committee. Anti-Semitic perspectives certainly don't need to be. Uh, and whatever the form takes, she needs to be directly and individually censured either by a censure uh, motion. We know that when Representative Steve King, the Iowa Republican, uh, expressed uh, bigoted views, he was stripped of his committee assignments. That's what a party does when it wants to send a clear message that bigotry has no place. They didn't say, Steve King represents his constituents, those views need uh, a place on the, uh, his committees. They took his committees away from him. It's not clear why Democrats would do less. Eugene, some Democrats have been excusing Omar's comments as uh, naive because she, she doesn't know any better. Now, this is from someone that has tweeted in the past that Israel hypnotizes the world to not see its evil doings. Now, it seems as though we're willing to give people who use anti-Semitic tropes the benefit of the doubt, whereas that isn't extended to other forms of bigotry. Is there more tolerance for debate over what constitutes anti-Semitism uh, over what uh, constitutes uh, other forms of racism. Yeah, I'm afraid so. And I think uh, to say that uh, Congresswoman Omar doesn't know what she's saying is to be condescending. And, uh, you know, that itself is an insult to her. That's saying that she's stupid and that she's repeatedly stupid over and over again. I don't think she's stupid at all. I think she knows exactly what she's been doing because she's doing it over and over consistently with the same message. And what she's doing is a very conscious effort. It's far from naive, it's sophisticated. She's trying to expand the boundaries of what you can say about Jews. She's trying to push the goalposts so that after oh, Omar, a Democrat who merely takes a very strong anti-Israel position is going to look like a philo-Semitic compared to Omar. So well, she's trying you, to do you move think the that goalposts. That, do you think that that debate, that moving of the goalposts, uh, is as acceptable when it comes to other forms of bigotry? Uh, certainly not. With other uh, forms of bigotry, there's a clear line. Uh, but so I why? Think because why? The why Democrats do you think that so this afraid, is more? Why do you think that there's more flexibility, if you will, on this issue? Uh, because the Democrats are very scared of their progressive caucus. Uh, and their progressive caucus is both mo very vocal about policing other forms of bigotry, uh, and that is one reason they uh, there's such a bright line there. And at the same time, the Progressive Caucus seems to be dedicated to policies that uh, are based on anti-Semitic views and which are directly harmful uh, to the Jews. So uh, the Democrats are afraid to take them on because I think the Democrats have mistakenly bought into the Progressive uh, 
coalition's propaganda, that they are an ascendant demographic, that they're the future of the Democratic Party. I think the Democratic Party has a great future outside of anti-Semitism if it chooses to forego anti-Semitism. I think this is the biggest risk that the Democratic Party, but some Democrats seem to be scared. Uh, Eugene, stick around. Uh, we want to get your legal analysis on uh, the topic of Prime Minister Netanyahu as well. And uh, one of the key players in the fraud allegations against the Prime Minister says that he didn't realize a gift would uh, trigger this uh, criminal investigation. Movie producer Arnon Milken gave Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sarah thousands of dollars worth of gifts over the years. The gifts triggering the corruption probe known as Case 1000. Milken said on Israeli TV today that he didn't think it was a terrible thing to give presents to a friend, but added that looking back, he may have uh, consulted with someone. Now, last week, the Israeli attorney general announced that he plans to pursue charges against Netanyahu in Case 1000, as well as two other cases. Uh, Eugene, let's get your legal perspective on this. Like, firstly, to be clear, Same. he is not being charged or indicted yet. There still needs to be a hearing on this. So what happens during this hearing? And how likely is it that Netanyahu will not be indicted following this hearing? So that's the amazing thing about the uh, recent announcement by the Attorney General. Uh, it's not an announcement of an indictment. The indictment requires there to be a hearing uh, where uh, the Prime Minister's lawyers uh, have an opportunity to rebut the charges, to explain why they're legally meritless. That hearing is not going to happen until late 2019 at the earliest. So why announce 40 days before the election that the Attorney General intends to issue an indictment when, first of all, hopefully he's open to changing his mind uh, when confronted with arguments by the defense. And so the indictment may never happen, which really raises the question, why was it so crucial to say that he intends to indict now, 40 days before the election, when in Israel there's a very strong legal norm, Supreme Court has repeatedly articulated, that the government should not take any kind of major actions in the run-up to an election because it could be prejudicial and it could bias voters and impact yeah. the election. What could be a more important action than saying you're going to indict the prime minister? And uh, that uh, is one of the reasons that the prime minister is calling this a politically motivated uh, witch hunt. I want to focus quickly on, on the most serious case as it's seen, and that is case 4000, the Beza mm -hmm. case. That involves media mogul Shaul Elovich. He's the controller of Israel's largest telecom company, Bezek. And uh, Netanyahu is accused of seeking favorable coverage from Walla, that's an Elevitcher-owned news site, in return from regulatory decisions that uh, would have benefited the media mogul, uh, including a, a merger of two companies there. Now, has there been seemingly unduly positive coverage of Bibi in, in Walla? I mean, is that something that the prosecution would have to prove without a doubt in, in the first place to set out this case? So first of all, the prosecution would have to prove something which so far we don't have uh, any evidence of, uh, or we don't know any evidence of, namely a quid pro quo. That is to say, it's not a crime for a politician to say, I want the media to cover me better. Guys, cover me better, give me some good press. That's what all politicians say. Politicians are all criticizing the media for being overly negative about them. Uh, now, that's not a crime. Uh, nor is it a crime for uh, a merger between two media companies to be approved. And it's not a, a crime for the same government to do both. The only potential crime would be if there's a quid pro quo. If the prime minister said, if you cover uh, me favorably, I'll approve your merger. But there's no evidence that he made that quid pro quo statement. And indeed, the decision to approve the merger was not made by the prime minister. Like many things in Israel, the decision is actually controlled by professional civil servants, by bureaucrats. This was not something the prime minister had the power to make or break. And in fact, Walla didn't cover him favorably. So he didn't approve the merger. They didn't cover him favorably during the uh, 2015 election, which is the time he would need it most. So it's, you know, I think this allegation is simply saying, mogul, 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 ask a mogul. And if you say the word media mogul enough, uh, it sounds dirty or criminal. But politicians routinely right. talk to media moguls, say that they're not covering them favorably. Uh, Eugene, we're out of time, but we appreciate your analysis. Thank you so much, Eugene Kontorovich. Hey, my pleasure, Michelle. Always All good right. to be here. Take care. All right.